This video has been sponsored by Zombie Lips, the chapstick solution for when you feel like your face is falling off. If you hear knocking on your door in the middle of the night, it could very well be the black eyed children. So be careful, as they'll make the darkness take control. Number one. Firstly, I would like to state that I am an atheist and tend to remain skeptical when it comes to the supernatural or paranormal. But there have been a handful of events that have occurred in my life that science or rational thought cannot explain. One such moment occurred in July of last year. For context, I am a 23 year old man, originally from the north of England, but now I'm currently living in the West Midlands. During the events of this experience, I was house sitting with my boyfriend. They had a large amount of land located in the middle of nowhere. And by nowhere, I mean in the middle of a forest, on the top of hills, and surrounded by mountains and caves. Our friend and her husband had gone on holiday, but due to having a lot of land, a very large and ostentatious home, and a lot of animals to look after, they needed someone there. I didn't mind though, as I already live in the countryside, and because of my boyfriend's work, I am usually home alone, so I don't mind the isolation that much. I imagined it would be fun to explore the woods play with the animals on the farm, and even go explore the caves nearby, as they were full of ruins and cave houses that were built during the Bronze Age or something. We were staying in the guest house and were tasked with making sure the gardens were looked after, the yard was kept clean, and the house itself was secure, and the six horses, five geese, and two farm cats were all thoroughly looked after. Despite it being a lot of work, cleaning up after the horses, and just generally looking after the place, we were enjoying ourselves, taking time to swim in the pool, and binge watching Stranger Things on Netflix. However, my boyfriend had recently been promoted, and was unfortunately called into work for the last few days of the week. He tried to make sure that he helped me with all the jobs before he left in the afternoon. But on the Friday, I had to do the afternoon chores all by myself. So after feeding the horses, I put the geese back in their shed, making sure they had water and food. When I noticed the two farm cats acting very strange, Harry and Jack, despite being tough farm cats, had the nicest disposition ever. They were really friendly. But now they were stood by one of the big gates on the yard, hissing at the bolted and locked wooden gate. Then suddenly they stopped hissing, and climbed back into their little wooden house, seemingly for the night. After locking the geese in their hut, and making sure it was secured against the local fox, I went over to the big yard gate. I tried to peep through this massive barbed wire gate, to see if there was anyone outside but there was nothing. In truth, I didn't expect to see anyone, because the house itself was in the middle of forest and hills. Pretty much, I was in the middle of nowhere, and the nearest village was about a 20 minute drive away. I chalked it up to the cat's odd behaviour, up to a naughty fox trying to sneak in. But, I couldn't help feeling a little freaked out. After giving the cats food and water, I locked them in their little cool cat house, just to make sure that they wouldn't be brawling with the local fox or other wildlife. Once I did that, I did one last check of the horses in the fields, so I hiked up the hill, and whilst checking on the two mares, I got this odd sense like someone was watching me. I would have chalked it up to paranoia, but suddenly the two mares let out a shrill and bolted. I felt both confused and worried, as the very normally placid mares rushed out of the field and hid inside their shelter. If that wasn't weird enough, 
things only grew more troubling. When I made my way back down through the fields, I discovered that all the horses were doing the same. The big boisterous stallion Saxon was hiding with his field shelter, and the little family, a trio of horses comprised of a mare, foal and male horse, had also taken to hiding in their shelter at the far end of the field. This was really weird. I had spent every hour of the day for a week observing these animals and looking after them, and they had never acted like this before. I even considered calling back my boyfriend, but couldn't help feeling like I was overreacting. As I finished tidying the yard, I switched on the electric fences and made my way back to the guest house. It was getting cold, and it was somewhat soothing. We had experienced a week of scorching Spanish weather, so a little breeze and shade was actually quite nice. But the breeze turned to gale, and the grey clouds above me went black, as black as night. I remember feeling very strange, as I looked up at the suddenly tempest skies. All of a sudden, the heavens unleashed, and I rushed down the garden path back to the guest house, which was situated next to the electronic gate, and just across from the main house. I suddenly felt a lot safer, and then I thought to myself, safer? Safe from what? I had no idea why I was freaking out so much. I told myself to stop being stupid, and kept telling myself, people of my age shouldn't be getting worked up over nothing. So I opened the guest house door, and proceeded to tidy up the wheelbarrows away, and locked up the garage, which was handily connected to the side of the guest house, with its roof sheltering me from the rain. Then, a rather nasty wind whipped down through the path, leading up to their garden, startling not just me, but all the birds who were nesting in the bushes at the time. Their unexpected and frantic screeching was enough for me. I slammed the garage door shut, locking it quickly, and scrambled back into the guest house. Now, all the time we had been staying there, we had never locked the door to the guest house. I guess we felt safe behind the high walls and electronic gates. I see now that we were foolish to think so. Yet something about tonight made me want to lock that door. Perhaps it was because the weather was so strange, or because of the odd behaviour of the animals. Or, maybe, it was the notion that my boyfriend was the only person who knows I'm out here and could help me and would not be back until around three in the morning. Regardless, Something about tonight made me feel like the simple wooden door and its easily smashable glass windows were all the protection I had, so I locked the door from the inside and kept the keys in my pocket. I sat down on the sofa, I turned on the television, and began watching my favourite soap opera to take my mind off my irrational fears. However, every now and again, my eyes would veer away from the television and gaze out to the three very large windows looking out across the gravelly front yard and the distant rain-drenched garden. I don't know why I kept looking out of the windows, but in hindsight, I think it was my instincts telling me to do so, to keep a watch because something was coming. Eventually, evening turned to night and I let out a tired yawn as I watched as the lights around the yard automatically came on. I looked out down past the kitchen, and out the glass on the door, to see the patio light turn on, just as it had always done. I know it seems silly, but the idea of being surrounded by light made me feel safe. Nothing can hide in the light, and it seemed like light was able to banish all bad things. All bogeymen in the closets, all monsters under the bed, and it could even get rid of nightmares. And now I was safe, surrounded by my lights. How stupid I was. 
all of a sudden, a loud knock rapped upon the guesthouse door, almost causing me to jump out of my skin. I looked over to the door, but the patio light had gone off and made it difficult to see anything. Feeling really frightened, I turned the television off and looked out the living room window to check that the electronic gates were still shut, which they were. I kept thinking maybe my imagination had got the best of me, and that my fear had just made me believe I had heard the knock on the door. However, any doubt I had was washed away by a second, more firmer knock that rattled against the glass on the door. Utter disbelief took hold, and I could feel myself leave my body. That's how shocked I was. I mean, this isn't a street in the middle of an estate. This was in the middle of nowhere. For a moment, I sat there listening to the rain drumming on the windows of the guest house, and with a deep breath, I stood up, stepping towards the kitchen and the front door. To my shock and surprise, on the other side of the glass door were two young boys. They looked to be around 12 or 14, and the dark hoodies that they wore were sodden from the rain. Almost as if they had been stood out there the entire night. They looked pale and cold, and a surge of humanity and compassion swept over me, causing me to almost make a massive mistake. I rushed over to the door and went to open it, fearing that the children may be injured or lost. But then it suddenly dawned on me. Where did they come from? How did they get in without me opening the electronic gates? I withdrew my hand from opening the door, and the two boys kept up looking towards me from behind the glass, with most of their face still shrouded behind their hoods. Please let us in. We went for a walk and got lost in the woods. The taller and more mature of the boys spoke. His words seemed more calculating and smooth than what a child's should be. We're cold and lost and scared, the smaller boy whimpered. His words pulled on my heartstrings, and I did feel really worried for them. But then once again, I reminded myself this wasn't possible. So I summed up all my courage and all my breath and asked the two children a question. Where did you come from and how did you get here? The gate was open. We saw the lights on and we rushed over. Please can we come in and get out of the cold? We just want to phone our parents. They'll be worried sick. The taller boy exclaimed this, with his well-composed words luring me towards the door. Again I found myself believing the words of the more mature boy, and I almost believed his explanation before I suddenly realised that the gates had been closed since before my boyfriend had left. Only we were in possession of the remotes used to open the gates, and I knew I hadn't opened them. You're lying. The gates have been shut all night, and I've never seen you come in. So where did you come from? The two young boys looked at each other, and then what happened next sent shivers down my spine. They turned their heads to look behind them, and there down the garden path was an even taller boy emerging from the darkness. His long, slender form seemed to drift through the bushes and trees that hung over the little pathway. Like the others, he was wearing a dark hoodie, and his spindly hands were cold white. What little I could see of his face looked like the two smaller boys, pale and ghostly. I shuddered, and the whole kitchen went cold. I could literally see my breath, and I felt more terror from these three young boys than I've ever felt for anything else. I know it seems crazy, but there was something about their voices and their near-identical clothing. It just wasn't normal, but was like they were trying to appear as normal and as human as they could but lacked the sense of identity and uniqueness that all humans had. As the older boy approached, I realised that he was as tall as me, and he stood between the two haunting children. 
and I stepped back. Please, let us in. It's cold and dark and we're frightened, the taller boy said. Weirdly, his voice still sounded partially young and childlike, but it just didn't seem normal. I stepped in a little further. Come on, Connor, let us in. We can't come in unless you say it's okay. The older and more dominant of the three boys called out. My eyes widened in disbelief as I let out a gasp. I felt my whole body shiver with fear, and my heart threatened to stop. How could they know my name? That's impossible. This sort of stuff doesn't happen in real life. And hoping this was all some kind of hallucination or my imagination gone wild, I closed my eyes for a moment and hoped they would be gone. But when I opened my eyes, they were still there. G get out of here, I'm gonna call the police. My words didn't carry any form of strength. They wouldn't get here in time. You're in the middle of nowhere. You're all alone with us, the tallest boy said, as the two little ghostly boys giggled. Their hideous giggling and heinous laughter sent fear rocketing through me. I could feel my eyes filling with tears and terror filled me. They still kept laughing as they crackled and giggled, and I saw their teeth were black, as black as charcoal. Go away, leave me alone, I cried out. But the boys suddenly stopped laughing, and pushed their faces up against the glass on the door. I let out another gasp. Their eyes, their eyes were black. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, and I knew that these three phantoms were not children. Whatever these creatures were with their eyes like midnight, and their festering grins, they were not human. And worse than that, they were thoroughly enjoying terrorizing me. You're going to die in there, the smaller boy giggled. At that, I let out a yelp and ran into the living room. I slammed the kitchen door shut and pushed one of the living room chairs up against it. I kept fearing that the simple wooden chair would not be enough to keep them out, and staggered backwards towards the bedroom. But I could still hear them, giggling and taunting me. I could feel my heart thumping, and the sense of fight or flight was taking hold. But I couldn't fight whatever those things were, and I couldn't run away either. Where would I go? If I could somehow escape into the woods, I dreaded to think what else could be lurking there. Or what if I managed to escape on a horse? Would I be safe with them? I doubted it. And what if I was outside, and there was more than three of them, in the same way that the third just seemingly apparated out of nowhere? As I wrestled with my chances and choices, I suddenly realized that I couldn't hear them anymore. And my eyes caught a glance of something pale, and then I saw them standing on the other side of the living room windows. Each of the three children was stood in front of one of the large three windows grinning at me. I wanted to run over and shut the blinds, but my feet wouldn't move, and when they finally did, I ran for the bathroom, the only room in the guest house with a lock, and I locked myself inside. I sat in the shower with the lights off, hoping they would just leave. As I lay there, praying to every god, angel, demon and deity I could think of. But none of them answered or came to my aid. It was like the boy said. I was alone. For hours I stayed there, listening to the chorus that the boys continued to yell. Let us in. Let us in. It seemed like it would never end. Until suddenly... And abruptly, it did. I couldn't hear them anymore, and after about 30 minutes of golden silence, I summoned up what courage I had left and peeked out the bathroom. The boys were gone from the living room window. So seeing my chance, I ran over and shut the blinds. Then I wondered if they were at the front door. So again I took a deep breath and pushed the chair aside and opened the kitchen door. They weren't there anymore and the patio light was on again. They were gone. However, I took no relief from their disappearance, for even though I knew they were gone, physically, 
I couldn't help feeling as though they were still lurking somewhere down the garden, just watching me from the shadows and just waiting for me to let my guard down, to jump out and begin the terrorizing anew. For the rest of the night, I sat up with all the lights on and a big kitchen knife in my hand, waiting for my boyfriend to come back. When morning came and I heard the gates open, my eyes were heavy and I was exhausted. But that sound filled me with a wave of energy. I rushed over to the front door, unlocking it, and sprinted over to him. In a frantic ramble, I tried to tell him what happened, and despite him saying he believed me, I could see he didn't. Why wouldn't he? I was on edge the rest of my time there. I couldn't sleep properly, and every time we were back in the fields or in the garden, I could sense their eyes on me. The following days, nothing happened, and the owners returned as usual. I wanted to tell them what I had experienced as they were good friends of ours, but I didn't want to freak them out or sound crazy. So, I kept it to myself. As we had breakfast with them, one of the owners, Steph, told us how much of a good job we did, and asked if we enjoyed it, which I replied with a reluctant yes. Her mood changed and her eyes looked worried as she asked me if there were any problems. I assumed by problems she meant with the animals. And when I told her the animals were great as usual, she looked at me and asked if someone tried to break in. I could feel what she was about to say before I could even say it. And I knew I didn't want to hear it. I would prefer my experience with those boys to be just a hallucination or the onset of madness but I knew by the look in her eyes that she was going to tell me otherwise. Steph said the last few times they went on holiday, they would come home and find footage on the CCTV of three boys knocking at the door late at night and calling for someone to let them in. They had the police search the grounds and surrounding area, but there were no signs of a break-in. In truth, there were no signs that the boys ever existed. I told her about my experience, and she seemed genuinely unnerved, and my boyfriend, who is as sceptical as they come, apologised for not believing me. They asked if we would ever house it for them again, and without hesitation, I said respectfully no. I never wanted to cross paths with those strange boys and their midnight eyes. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if I had actually let them in. I imagine... I would not be here to tell this account if I'd have done so. I don't know who or what they were or where they came from. All I know is that they weren't normal. They're real. And I will never forget my visitation from the black-eyed children. Number two. So about five years ago, when I was 20 years old, I had my one and only encounter with the black eyed kids. I was staying with a couple who I would babysit for during the day and would sometimes help the husband with wildlife retrieval. It was very creepy in itself due to the fact he worked at night. To be clear, these people lived in the Florida swamps, so we were out in the middle of nowhere. One night, his wife decides to go on the job with him and leave me alone with the kids. So I popped in a movie since we didn't have cable or internet being in the middle of a swamp. As I'm watching the movie, I hear what sounds like knocking coming from the window overlooking the back deck. Which was odd because the back deck was rotting, so standing on it was not only a hazard but damn well near impossible. I was startled and gasped looking back out that window expecting to see an animal. What I saw still haunts me whenever I see a window without curtains. It was a kid around 12 years old, staring into the window, hands cupped around his eyes. He had what looked like a black hoodie on, and all I could see was his smile. It was hideously wide and sinister. He mouthed, Let me in. I'm cold. But how could it be cold in 98 degree muggy ass Florida temperature? I was shocked and strangely drawn to stare back at him. Suddenly I snapped to my senses when I saw this kid bolt from the window. 
I ran to the side door of the house to lock the unlocked side door. I got to the door, and he stood in the open doorway just staring at me like before. Only this time the words echoed clearly. Let me in, I'm cold, and I can't come in unless you invite me in. I ran to the door, slamming and locking it as well. I then locked the front door and waited. I had nothing after that, but when the parents got home and walked in the door, they looked absolutely horrified. They said they had security cameras that are connected to their phones. They saw a kid stand at the front door with a large kitchen knife, but he stood off to the side so as not to be seen when anyone opened the door, which only means he was planning on stabbing me, which creeps me out enough. But what they led me out to see horrified me beyond words. On the door, carved, were the words, You're so lucky. I went and stayed with a friend after that, and I never travelled back to the Florida swamps again. Number 3 I was over at my aunt's house, waiting for her to get home, so that she could give me a ride to my house. Whilst I was waiting, my little cousin came home, after his dad dropped him off, and he told me to just watch him until his mum arrived, so we sat on the couch. My cousin didn't say anything to me, which is weird for him. He's one of these little kids who loves to talk. So I hear his dad pull out the driveway, but I didn't hear him drive away, and what seemed like, not even five minutes later, someone else knocks on the door so I assume it's him. I look outside the window, but her TV is in the way, so I can see outside but I can't see who's at the door, and I don't see or hear any cars outside. So I get kind of scared right off the bat, like I usually do when I'm home alone, but it's really quiet in the house. I forgot all about my cousin on the couch, so I just stand there by the window, hoping whoever was there would just leave. It was quiet for a few minutes, so I started to walk back to the couch. What's weird is that I was walking back to the same couch my cousin was on, but I don't remember seeing him there. Right when I start walking away, someone knocks on the window. I was still pretty close to the window, so it made me jump. So I yelled and asked who it was. And someone replied, It's me. So I relaxed. Thinking it was my aunt, I didn't even bother to listen to the voice that called out, which I know now wasn't my aunt. I opened the door, and it was two kids. One taller than the other. At first, I'm thinking they're both boys, but they both kept their heads down, so that I couldn't see their eyes, and they were both wearing oversized hoodies. They say, can we come in? And they sound like they're nervous at first which to me explained why their heads were down. I said, no, and that's when they both lifted up their heads, and I saw their eyes, which were all black. Then they both said together, I need to call my mum. It was like something out of a corny, scary story. I looked closely at them, and their hoodies that they were wearing were now fitted, but before the hoodies were three sizes too big, and they were now grey instead of black and their hoods were no longer on their heads, and I could see their hair, and I knew that the older kid was a boy and the little one was a girl. I never took my eyes off them, and it felt like everything about them was changing. They were never smiling before, but now their faces looked really mad and frustrated. The little one then said, Please, we need to come in. Just say yes. And he said this quite frantically. I looked down at the screen door between us, and it was no longer locked. It was open, and when I saw one of the kids reaching for it, I slammed the door shut and tried to lock it, but it wouldn't lock. They weren't very complicated, but my hands just weren't working with me, and I couldn't coordinate to twist all the locks, and I kept trying for what seemed like forever, but it felt like something was messing with my hands, so I gave up and ran to the couch and sat down staring at the door. I was just ready for these kids to bust in, and I was ready to fight, so I didn't think of calling anybody, but nothing happened, and it was just quiet in the house. 
Now I'm finally remembering my cousin. So I look over and he's on the far end of the couch, curled up. And I think he's asleep. So for the next hour, I just sat on the couch. I was shaking and twitching. And I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. And then my auntie finally showed up. And as soon as she did, my cousin popped up to greet his mum. I asked my cousin if even though he was asleep, he remembered anything. Which he didn't. I just hope I don't encounter these creepy kids again. Number 4 I recently read a story about the Black Eyed Kids. This story felt like a twisted tale of deja vu. I believe I've encountered one. I've never mentioned this particular detail about the eyes to anyone, for fear they think I were fabricating the story or going crazy. The incident took place about 13 years ago. I had just moved to a new city with my wife. We were small town newlyweds from the Midwest. We'd moved cross country to one of the biggest cities in the Southwest so that I could attend graduate school. Being naive and new to city living, I habitually answered the door without a second thought, but never again after this. The first thing that should have tipped me off to the peculiarity of the situation was the fact that someone was knocking at 6am. The second thing that should have dawned on me is that this kid had reached over a rather tall patio gate to unlatch and open it. The knock at the door was startling. My wife and I were getting ready for work, a pretty normal routine. The moment I opened the door, I was overtaken by an inexplicable sense of fear. To this day, I can picture him. Teenager, average height, average build, knee-length black leather coat, short black hair and sunglasses. The sunglasses at 6am struck me as odd, and even more odd, he was eating an apple. He was very polite and asked if he could come in and warm up. I said no and closed the door and slid the security chain in place. A moment later, another knock. I opened the now chained door and before I could speak, he asked me again if he could come in and warm up. No, I reply and attempt to close the door. But before the door could shut, he puts his hand out, stopping the door on his hinges. He looks directly into my eyes, still wearing his sunglasses and says, Can I at least get some ketchup for my apple? Uh, no, I reply, albeit a little confused. Get the hell out of here, my wife is calling the police. He takes a moment to let this information sink in, lowers his glasses, revealing his eyes are as black as obsidian, and says, No, you won't be calling anyone. At that moment, I force the door closed, lock it and call out to my wife. She's scared shitless hiding in the bedroom, all jacked up on adrenaline. I rip the curtains back to look out the window next to the door. He's gone. Absolutely no trace of him. I go out to the patio and check the gate. It's still latched from the inside. That was messed up, I think to myself. And as I turn to enter the house, I notice a half-eaten apple lying on the ground. Number 5 Reading the stories, I had always been a skeptic. Stories, alleged first-hand experiences, hauntings, possessions. They are all well and good for a quick chill, a cheap thrill, something I read to get my heart rate up. Getting scared can be fun sometimes, as long as you don't overdo it. Just a little something silly to get worked up about. In my lurking in books, and on numerous sites on the internet, credible or not, I have come across many a story or account about ghosts, demons, the Jersey Devil, you name it. Recently, I have found my way into stories about B.E.K., or black-eyed kids. No, these children did not get a black eye from a fight. I don't believe there would be a soul out there with the backbone to try and attack these kids. No. BEKs are kids. If that was not straightforward enough, usually, from all the accounts I have read, in their teenage years, if they even physically age at all, their eyes are pitch black. No pupils, no corneas, no white showing at all. Pitch black. 
They have olive skin and wear run-of-the-mill clothing, as in hoodies. However, in a non-physical sense, they always bring with them an overwhelming sense of fear and dread. They are all intriguing, and when approached by them, again, from all the accounts I've come across, it's like you are in a slight hypnosis, though you quickly snap out of it when your instincts take over, usually as you meet their eyes. Then there are the theories, the theories about what these BEKs might be. These theories range from lost souls to alien human hybrids and even to vampires, though the latter may be an extreme stretch to link the BEK to the current social infatuation of vampires found commonly in young persons. In light of all this, I have always been a very fact-based person. If its existence was not apparent, or the existence of the thing in question was not testable and verifiable to me, it did not exist. However, one night, one long, terrifying night, which still haunts me to this very day, showed me the proof and required me to open my eyes and mind. My story begins when I left my mum's house. I had gone over to visit because my father, her husband of 63 years, recently passed away, and Mum wasn't taking it too well. I knew she needed support from her loved ones, and I was more than willing to go visit and keep her company, but it was getting late. My mum lives in the suburbs, tidy lawns, plenty of neighbors, paved roads, and even though it was near 11 p.m. when I left, the streets were extremely lit by the streetlights who always had your safety and ease of mind at heart. These lights only lit the road, though, and glancing across the street, the houses were cast in eerie shadow. Even a rather safe, charming little neighborhood can seem spooky and uninviting when cast in shadow. I admit, I was terribly chilled. Sliding into my car, I revved the engine and waved to my mother, who was standing in the doorway, wrapped comfortably in a warm shawl. She waved back, her old and fragile arm shaking. I saw her mouth, be careful, and I smiled, backing out of the driveway. I turned out of the neighborhood, deciding to take the back way, the shorter way, home tonight. In hindsight, that might have not been a good idea. I live a significant ways away, out in the middle of the country in the old farmhouse I grew up in, which my father had left in my name when he and Mum moved out into a place smaller, more easy for care and affordable, and social. He, my father, had always told me growing up, Don't go out at night and always beware the devils. He was a strong believer in anything and everything paranormal, a very superstitious man, and I always had to resist the urge to laugh at his words, but I knew he meant well. Driving down the dark country roads, there were no streetlights, and the half-assed paved road was cracked and filled with potholes. The fields on either side of the road were empty, just blank stretches of overgrown grass and untended shrubbery. The dark outline of the trees of the woods could be seen looming all the way across the fields on the shadowy horizon. One might even have seen a deer or two once in a while in those fields, but not tonight. The moon offered little light, as the sky rolled with dark, threatening clouds, ready to burst with rain or storm at any moment. Sure enough, a few moments later, the low grumble of thunder sounded heavy and long. However, no rain fell just yet, much to my pleasure. I hate driving at night and in the rain, and putting those two together would end badly. I just knew it. Accompanied by the occasional roll of thunder, I started to feel a bit anxious. I can't explain it. I just felt shaken up. Probably because it was night and it could start raining. Or maybe I had been reading too many ghost stories and legends, and tonight seemed to reflect the mood of the stories I read almost obsessively. To try and calm myself, I flicked on my old car's radio and turned the old-fashioned knob back and forth, slowing down a bit as I attempted to find a station that came in clearly. Nothing doing weird. There was a broadcasting tower right near here. It usually came in perfectly. Clear as day. But still nothing. The white noise and static of the blank stations was doing nothing to appease my anxiety. 
I gripped the steering wheel tightly as more thunder boomed from the sky. Aggravated, I forcefully shut off the radio, gritting my teeth. Glancing down at the dashboard, I noticed I was nearly out of gas. Groaning, I searched the road for a sign for gas. As I was scanning the side of the road, I noticed from the corner of my eye two figures walking on the side of the road, shrouded in shadow. They were walking slowly. One turned around, walking backwards, his or her thumb sticking out. I felt compelled to pull over, give them a ride, and I found my hands turning the wheel slightly, but I pulled back, realizing how stupid it would be of me to accept two random strangers into my car in the middle of the night on a back country road. I sped up and passed them, trying not to look at them. As I did so, though, I felt oddly intrigued by them. As I focused on the road ahead, it started drizzling, dropping my mood another level or two. Along with the rain, the thunder seemed louder, closer as the storm moved in. A few seconds passed until I gave in to my compulsion to look at the two figures, and I glanced in my rearview mirror. It seemed as if the two were walking faster, and the one no longer had his thumb out, but it had to be my imagination. How would I be able to tell if they were walking faster or not? It was rainy and dark. Looking back at the road, I almost missed a sign that alerted me of a gas stop up ahead. A sigh of relief passed my lips and I slowed down, looking for my indication of the stop, pushing the thought of the two figures from my head. Soon, I was pulling into the gas station slowly as the rain started to pick up. The store was closed, but luckily they had a 24-hour gas pump service. That was good for me, as if they had not, I'd have run out a few more miles down the road. I shut off my car and hesitantly shuffled out of the metal shell and glanced over my shoulder, still not being able to shake that nervous feeling that had manifested inside of me earlier that night. I stood under the light of the overhang, trying to figure out how to work the pump, which seemed so overcomplicated in the dim light and with my mind not being able to focus on this simple task. The rain picked up more heavier and louder against the concrete of the gas stop as I finally was able to get the pump into my car, forcing my hand to stop its shaking. I had a horrible feeling that my shaking wasn't just because of the bittery, cold night air. Suddenly, the overhang lights of the gas stop started flickering wildly, a couple going out altogether. It seemed as if the temperature dropped 20 degrees in a few seconds as I glanced around a sinking feeling starting to blossom in my stomach. As if in slow motion, I turned around, facing back towards the road, the long, lonely road, and I saw what I expected to see there. But even as much as I knew what I'd see, I still felt the drop of my stomach, the color draining from my face, and I breathed a sharp, cold breath forcefully as it almost caught in my throat. Across the street, the two figures were standing, facing me. They started crossing the street slowly but surely, and I fumbled with the gas pump. It had only been a few moments, but it seemed as if the gas pump was taking its precious time. I was shaking hard now, as thunder boomed once more, and I looked back up. The figures were now at the entrance to the gas stop, and my breath was quick and shallow as I blindly shoved the pump back into its holder not being able to tear my eyes away from the figures. As they drew closer, I became more frantic, even though, now as they walked into the flickering light of the overhang, I saw they were just two teenagers. They looked ragged and frigid and soaked from the rain. I straightened up a bit, still terrified, but another compulsive feeling, similar to the one I experienced in the car, was bubbling, and I felt obligated to talk to these two. Though, I insisted to myself to just drive away, not to risk anything. They were extremely close now, at the next pump when I slid into my car, shaking wildly, and fumbled for my keys, cursing myself as I dropped them on the floor. Leaning down, I swiped them up and sat back up. A cold, sickening feeling as I came face to face with one of the teens, who had his hands on my window, knocking slowly but forcefully. I rolled down the window a bit, just a bit, no bigger than to allow maybe a small child's hand through. 
Before I spoke, he spoke first. The other figure was standing in the background, still, but I could see something of a grin there on her pale face. Can you give us a ride into town? We missed the bus and don't have a ride. He spoke slow, and something about his voice made me shiver. A cold chill swept down my spine and I opened my mouth, but no sound came out. Clearing my throat, I glanced at the dashboard and the keys in my hand. Uh, I I'm sorry, but I'm not going into town, I stuttered, keeping my eyes down, not at the kids. However, the teenager knocked harder and made me jump a little, as he insisted another time for a ride. I told him no once more and looked up, trying to seem intimidating, which seems silly, trying to seem intimidating to a child, but a horrible, chilling sight greeted me. I looked the kid right in the eyes and gasped sharply, my back hitting my seat as I went to back away. He had eyes. Oh, he did. But they were blacker than the night. Pitch black. No discernible pupils and no white whatsoever showing. Pure, black, deep, brooding, and surprisingly intriguing. But my fear got the better of me and I quickly turned the key and my engine revved to life. I thanked God, which I had never, ever done before tonight. My car had not stalled, and I went to pull away, and the kid banged on my window with a pale fist, screaming for a ride. I took off speedily down the road, apologizing to my father again and again I had laughed at him, never took his warning seriously. After a few more minutes... I pulled into my driveway and right onto my lawn, in front of my porch. I didn't want to spend any more time outside than I already had, and jumped from the car, leaving the door open, and ran inside, slamming the door and locking it, even going as far to put a chair in front of the door in case someone, or something, tried to get in. Sinking into the chair in front of the door, I shivered uncontrollably and started to cry hiding my face in my hands as two dark figures stood at the end of my driveway. Number 6 I had one incident that happened to me last summer, whilst I was driving a semi over the road. I had just pulled into a truck stop outside of Billings, Montana. I pulled up, parked the truck in the back of the lot, and then went inside and showered. Come nightfall, I ran out of movies to watch in my truck. I had a 34 hour wait before I could drive the truck again legally. So I decided to go into the casino that was built inside the truck stop. I was playing slots and a beautiful American Indian girl was serving drinks. After quite a few drinks, I started chatting with her on a more personal level. She told me that her shift ended in a few hours, and that she would be behind the truck stop with a crate of beer if I felt like partying. I hung around the front of the building, and when everyone started filling out the doors, I went around back to meet her. I couldn't find her, but I found an older Mexican woman, who seemed to know my name, and acted as if I'd been speaking to her on the inside. I was buzzed, but not drunk nor stupid, and I knew this was not the same person. What also struck me as odd is that she had no personal belongings besides the clothes on her back. No purse, no key ring, nothing. I started to feel a little tripped out, so I told her that I didn't know her and didn't want to have anything to do with her. She became cold and stopped trying to talk to me. Here's the totally screwed part though. I walk all the way back up to my truck, climb into the back, change into my sleepwear, and laid on my bunk to reread a book. Only a few minutes had passed, and then I hear three loud bangs on my side of the sleeper. I open the curtains and roll down the window, and saw the young American Indian woman I had been speaking to earlier. She was standing next to my truck. I immediately picked up that something was wrong about her. It wasn't her lack of speech, odd, disheveled look, 
all rigid body movements. It was her eyes that got to me, solid black. I could say that the dark night, coupled with more than a few drinks, could make me think her eyes were black. But I'm not. When I hit a switch in the back of my truck, the inside lights up like a baseball stadium. Her eyes seemed to be pulling in the light, like miniature black holes. It reminded me of when a woman wearing mascara cries, and she kind of looks like a raccoon afterwards. It looked like she had rubbed charcoal around her eyes, and it also felt like my body was acting of its own accord. My body was screaming at my fragile psyche to open the door, and to let her into my truck, despite the fact that she looked freaking terrifying, and hadn't said a single word to me since meeting her again. I remember having to choke out the word, no, and it reminded me when you're saying it on the verge of tears, but you choke through them to speak to someone. That's how the word no felt when it was passing through my lips. I was too damn terrified to look outside my vents to see if she was still standing outside. I was too terrified that I may have ended up looking back into the darkness, only to know, in my mind's eye, that she could be staring right back at me. I've got the shakes just remembering that. Number 7 I had never heard of the black-eyed children, until I encountered them. Still not knowing who or what the hell they were, I did what any modern 25-year-old male would do. I googled them. And boy, was I shocked that I wasn't the only one. Had I not seen them for myself, I would have just thought it to be a modern-day urban legend gone viral. Besides my girlfriend, I've only told my brother, who is into everything creepy and horror, for I knew he would be the only one not to judge me, or try and commit me into a mental hospital. He's the one who said that I should tell my story. Anyway... I am an accountant. My girlfriend and I live in a small gated community in southern western Virginia called Glade Springs. That community has about 150 houses, a country club, and a steakhouse slash bar called Bunkers. Now, anyone can come through the gated community during the business hours of Bunkers, but after they close, the front security gate stops all traffic to make sure that you are a resident, and if you are a visitor, call the house that you're going to to verify that you are actually expecting them. Sometimes it's a hassle, but hey, you don't have to worry about robbery. So imagine my surprise when the doorbell rings at 3am. I was jarred awake, and wasn't sure if it was a dream, considering I had been to bed shortly before, and was probably just going into REM sleep. I rolled over and looked at the clock, noticing the time. But when my doorbell chimed again, I felt a cold chill run through my body. Not reading too much into it, it could be one of my neighbours. They may have an emergency. So I nonchalantly made my way to the door, and opened it. Luckily, the wrought iron storm door was still locked, because who or what stood before me was not a resident of the community. Two young boys stood at my doorstep, one looking to be around 17 and the other looking to be around 10, wearing dark hooded sweatshirts and jeans. The young one had shaggy, dirty blonde hair that would only look down at the stone steps, and the older one had his hood pulled up and tipped up to where I could only see half of his nose. The voice caught in my throat, and before I could even ask what they wanted, the older one spoke. His voice sounded forced and dry. There was no emotion or sincerity of what he said. I'm sorry to bother you and your girlfriend, but we need to come in and use your phone. We've been in an accident. I felt the familiar chill return to my body. How did he know my girlfriend was here? I wrote it off as an assumption, judging by our age and the fact that there were two cars in the driveway. I tripped over my words, 
Something about these kids weren't right. Wasn't normal. Wasn't human. Uh, uh, I can I can bring you my cell phone if you like, and you can call. I don't get service inside, so you'll have to stand on the sidewalk to call. I finally said, nervously. Of course, I was lying through my teeth. I just simply didn't want these kids in my house. Well, my brother really needs to use your bathroom cane. We have to come in. The older one said this, and that's when I went into a complete panic. He knew my name. I'm sorry, are you from here? How did you know my name? The words practically shook out of my mouth. That's when he became slightly hostile and demanded to be let in. I told them I was sorry and that I could not help them. And just as I was about to close the main door is when it happened. The both of them snapped their heads upwards and looked me straight into the eyes. Black. No iris. No pupil. No retina. Just pure deep black. I was paralysed with fear. For a second I thought those kids were just playing a really cruel joke and had snuck in the community somehow and bought some of those freaky supernatural demon sclera contacts. It wasn't until I heard ringing and then the flashback started. I was suddenly a toddler again at my grandparents house, sitting under a chestnut tree with my mother picking up nuts and putting them in a large metal soup kettle. It was a crisp full day. It was one of my earliest and dearest memories. I was about three and even have a picture, and I hold that day very dear to my heart. But then, they were there, behind my mother. We locked eyes, their eyes still black as night, and suddenly they smiled simultaneously. And that's when everything went dark. The next thing I knew, I was shaken awake, lying in the mudroom floor. My girlfriend standing over me with a worried look. What the hell, Kane? She asked. I had no idea what to answer. My head had taken a good whack against the slate floor, and a bit of dried blood was stuck in my hair. But other than that, I was physically fine. I slowly remembered everything that happened, and looked at the door. Daylight. I've never been so happy to see morning in all my life. I told my girlfriend everything that had happened, and I honestly think she thought I had brain damage from hitting the floor, but she insisted that she believed me. And then we googled it, and I believe that's when she started to believe me properly. I don't know who or what they were, or where they came from, but they're not of this world. I know that for a fact. For some reason, I had a lingering thought that they wanted me to know even my memories aren't safe. They are very strong and seem to be growing in numbers. For some reason they seem to not be able to hurt you physically unless you invite them in, which I don't know since either no one has let them in or the ones who have aren't around to tell the tale, but they can get into your mind. Since that night, I feel as though I've been watched, as though I see them from the corner of my eye I'll look to my girlfriend whilst we're at the movies for a diner, and her eyes will be solid black for a split second. And worst of all, they look like one of my most precious and most often reminisced memories, and have been turned to something sinister. Something that's now a constant reminder of the black-eyed children. Number 8. The Black-Eyed Kids? I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't know about them before this happened. Late summer last year, I definitely did. Now in the moment, that idea never crossed my mind, but afterwards, hell yes. And the thought led to all kinds of regret, and I realise it's stupid. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you about my neighbourhood. I live in a poor part of town, a bit of a ghetto. A bit of the barrio. A bit of the lower economic class of a cross-section of races. It's LA. The apartment complex spans a short block. It's dusty brown like the desert that we live in. It's got two pools, lots of Mexican children, 
and for the most part, a pretty friendly population. I am a destitute writer trying to make it into Hollywood, so I spend my free time writing. When this happened, I was working mostly in the mornings and afternoons. I would get home, hit the gym, and settle in for an evening in front of the computer. It's pretty common for the evenings in the summer to be chaotic around our apartment complex. Kids playing in the pool, the ice cream man pushing his cart up and down the sidewalk, and women talking outside, in the laundry room. You know, nice, low income but pleasant, like a mixed race 21st century version of a 50s sitcom. And people will knock on your door, sometimes to borrow something, and I cook so neighbours pop by to find out the origins of which great aromas are wafting through the kitchen window. Sometimes for a little help on a broken car, but mostly it's kids selling candy bars or Christmas wrappers, or jittery tweakers selling magazine subscriptions, or old Mexican men selling bootleg DVDs, and a hell of a lot of Jehovah's Witness. Because it's hot out, I leave my windows open, as the AC isn't cheap and I'm pretty much broke hoping for the cross breeze. That means, though I can't see anyone from where I sit and work, I can hear them clearly as they walk up to my door. When I hear someone knock, I answer it. Besides buying the occasional candy bar, I smile, politely decline, wish them a nice day, and send them on their way. No big deal. That evening it was quiet, which was strange in of itself. I should have at least been able to hear the distant sound of ranchero music. I heard a couple of people walk up to my door. I'm not the first apartment in my courtyard, so usually I hear the salespeople as they knock down on my neighbour's doors and work their way around me. Not this time. Whoever it was walked right up to my door and knocked. I got up to answer it, reaching for the door handle when a chill went through my body like I had never experienced a cold tightness in my chest. I halted the movement towards the door handle and placed it flat on the door as if I were feeling for heat from a fire. I have a peephole on my door, but it never crossed my mind to use it. I stood there with my hands flat on the door and listened. They knocked again. I don't scare easy, and I wasn't exactly afraid, but I was having a visceral experience all over my body. A base fear reaction, just like I could hear them. They had heard me move to the door. They knew that I was inside. Yes? Who is it? A boy's voice answered. We need to use your phone. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I stress laugh when I'm under pain or pressure, and that's what I started doing then. They heard me laughing and neither of us moved for about a minute or two. A really, really long minute or two. Finally, they walked away. Not to any other ones of the eight doorways within 15 feet. Not to anyone else. But before they could have gone more than a dozen yards, curiosity reasserted itself, and I yanked the door open, running after to see who it was and where they were going. The courtyard of my complex was completely empty. Afterwards, I thought of the experience fit into the stories about the black-eyed kids, and kicked myself for not opening the door. Coming face to face with a black-eyed kid? How cool could that be? But then I remember that feeling. My skin crawling, and the certain knowledge in me at that moment. There was no way I was going to open that door at that time. Number 9 Usually when you hear of black-eyed children knocking on people's door, it's some schmo living on a farm in the middle of nowhere, but this was not the case. I live in the suburbs, with neighbors all around and cars driving by at all hours of the night, and though I believe in the paranormal, I never thought I would have the encounter I had. It happened earlier this year around Thanksgiving 2015. Like any holiday, there were lots of neighbors hosting parties with their families and random kids running around and playing outside, which I guess is one of the reasons I was as foolish as I was that day. The sun was just going down, and I was home alone watching TV and eating some turkey, and that's when I heard a knock. 
I looked at the clock and it was almost 7.30. Thinking it was one of the neighbors, I swung the door open without even looking and there stood two kids. One of them was a little boy with a baseball cap on, blue jeans, and a jersey. The other was younger and shorter, but with no cap and looking towards the floor. I looked at them and asked if they needed anything, and the older boy chirped, Yes, we just need to come in to get our baseball from your yard. As soon as he said that, a chill went down my spine, and I had a horrible feeling that I should not let these boys in. I looked at him, studying his face, and... In the back of my head, I knew something was wrong with him, but I just couldn't place it. He must have noticed my hesitation because he exclaimed, Come on, ma'am, we just want our ball back. And that's when I realized this child had no whites in his eyes. I was kind of shocked and flabbergasted. At first, I thought they were black contact lenses. I looked over at his brother, and I noticed he had the same eyes. My face must have given it away, because as soon as I looked back to the leader, his eyes filled with hatred, and his cool smile turned into an evil smirk, and I swear he stood taller and more confident, staring into my eyes, and that smile that hinted, he knew what I was thinking. At that moment, the atmosphere changed from what I perceived at the beginning of the encounter as two normal and innocent boys standing in front of me wanting their ball back to two inhuman beings wanting to invade my home and create havoc onto my life. I just stared at him as he smirked. The smaller boy stood firmly and confidently on two feet and he got taller and he also stared. After about 30 seconds of staring, the smaller boy broke the silence. Come on, ma'am. Just let us in. And the way he said it, I could tell something changed in him, because he spoke with such conviction in his voice. I stared at him and he smirked, all knowingly, and I didn't know what to say. In my head, I wanted to scream and call them out, tell them they were demons from another world and to get off my porch. But at the same time, I began to wonder about my safety. If I did that, it could be worse for me. I mean, what if instead of just asking to come in, they force their way into my home and my life? What if they get violent? I thought to myself, this charade we're playing by pretending this isn't what it is. If I don't play this game anymore, it could be detrimental to my own health and well-being. I made the decision to keep playing and I looked at the smaller of the two beings and said, Yeah, I'll get it for you. And grabbed the door and slammed it in their face and began walking. I turned on all the lights and sat on my couch with my feet pulled up to my chin and I began to shake and rock back and forth and listen, but I heard nothing. No laughter outside. No children playing. No shuffling at my door. The world fell at a standstill as I sat there silently in the fetal position and then I heard a slow knock at my door. I immediately stopped rocking and stood still, listening intently as another knock fell upon the door. I didn't know what to do. I stared at the door and listened as another knock came through the door. I refused to get up. My body so stiff and my arms so tightly wrapped around my legs I could feel the veins in my arms pumping in blood. And the slow knocks continued for at least two minutes followed by silence so ear-piercing I wondered if I lost my hearing. The entire night went by and I sat in my living room not knowing what to do. I don't know when I dozed off, but I woke up around 2 a.m. and the lights were off in my house. The TV screen that was once on Comedy Central now filled with black and white static. I don't know how, but something was inside of my home. Number 10. I want to share an experience I had a few nights ago. I was simply relaxing at home watching a few DVDs before heading to bed, when I was interrupted by a knock at the door. As I normally do, I attempt to switch on the outdoor patio light, which, conveniently, blew up as I flicked the switch. Nevertheless, I opened the door. There were two kids at the door. Both looked as though they were around 12 or 13. The first one, which decided to back off the porch, was short and wore a plain red t-shirt and cargo shorts. I couldn't see much of him, to be honest, so I can't say much about what he looked like. 
Their second, who I assume knocked on the door, was slightly taller than the first kid, and he wore a plain green t-shirt, also with cargo shorts, and he had medium length black curly hair sitting under a plain green baseball cap. Due to the conveniently blown light bulb, I also couldn't see him clearly as well. This was compounded by the fact that the street lights on my street were out. So I opened the door and asked what they wanted. The first kid answered me, Good day, mate. We're just hoping if we could come in to get our kitten out of your backyard. Now, three things were immediately odd. I've never had a 13 year old kid say, Good day, mate, as it's usually hi or hey, never good day, mate. It was like he was trying to be a stereotypical Australian. His accent was weird, halfway between Australian and English, and it appeared as though he was putting it on. When I was 13, I was not going around on weekdays at midnight. I don't know about the rest of you guys. Now, considering the three points I've just mentioned, I was kind of taken aback by the odd request. I said, Okay, I can go get it for you. To which he replies, Nah, mate. We insist that we need to go get her. She's really scared by strangers. Again, this was unusual. He called me mate in that weird accent and his claim about the cat didn't really seem valid. It's a kitten. Now, this time, I actually considered letting them in, but that weirdness factor actually overcame that. I asked him, how old are you, buddy? To which the one at the back replied, and I must say enthusiastically, 16. You don't look 16, I say. The kid closest to the door started becoming a little tense and changed the subject back. Look, mate, we need to come in and get our kitten. I was a bit shocked how his friendly tone had turned a bit hostile. So I replied, look, kid, if you're going to be rude, you won't be getting your kitten back. He apologized and then pleaded to come in to get the cat. Now I was becoming very suspicious of their intentions. A lot of stuff had been happening lately here in Australia like assaults, home burglaries, where adults had been bashed by kids. It's becoming more frequent. So naturally my instincts were to subtly spot any concealed weapons. What happened next shocked me. The first kid straight up said, We don't have any weapons on us. Dumbfounded, I almost responded, How did you know I was thinking that? but changing the subject to avoid them becoming more suspicious. What I actually said was, does your mother know you're out here this late? He replied, come on mate, just let us in. Our mother will get angry if we don't come home with the kitten. By this time I had enough. I said, tell you what, give me your phone number and I'll call your mum tomorrow. And if I find the kitten, I will bring it back. I almost opened the door to give them pen and paper. As I moved my hand towards the door though, the kid stepped right up to it. This is where it turned from unusual to creepy. He had a really sinister grin on his face and I could have sworn his eyes were completely black and that made me immediately jerk back from the door. I said, okay, you need to get away from my front door now. We're just kids, mate. Let us in to get our kitten. Leave now or I'm calling the cops. Both kids simply stared at me. They were really freaking me out, and I had the sneaking suspicion they wanted to do something to me. To show them I was serious, I turned back and grabbed my mobile phone, with the intention of making it look like I was serious about calling the cops. But when I turned back, they were gone. Just like that. So I shut the door. I had a bit of a desire to go out and see where they went but I also had a bad feeling about the events that had just occurred. The whole thing lasted for about two and a half minutes, but it was the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to me. I'm not someone that's had of lifetime experiences of being in contact with paranormal phenomena, and I believe most of the stuff is either rubbish or a case of mistaken identity, but I'm still racking my brains for a rational explanation to this. Number 11. Let me preface this by saying, I am by no means a writer, just a domestic engineer 
living in North Texas. Also, I don't believe in paranormal ghosts, demons, or aliens, or whatever. However, I did have an event happen to me this Halloween. I have to admit, it's had me scratching my head ever since. So it had been a slow trick-or-treat night in our neighbourhood that evening, which is pretty odd in itself. We usually have kids from different areas drop off in ours and constantly parade at our door. That night, I'd say we had no more than 8 to 10 groups of kids. It was around 9.30 and my husband and I were sitting in our family room watching some of the ghost shows based on, supposedly, actual events. Like I said, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. But I do like a good ghost story now and then, and it is Halloween after all. We hadn't had any activity at the door in over half an hour. It was getting late, so we decided to turn the porch light on and let our dog Chloe out of her crate. Chloe is an American Bulldog and is very docile. We only put her in the crate because we were afraid she'd try and get out and play with all the other kids and I didn't want to have to chase after her down the street. I also didn't want her scaring or intimidating the kids, because she can be a little scary. So I turned the outside light off, let Chloe out, and she followed me back to the couch and lay down on my feet. It was getting close to 10pm when my husband decided he'd had enough fun for the night, and was going to go upstairs, take a shower, and get ready for bed. After all, it was Thursday, and he still had to get up early for the next day. Our teenage son was out with his friends at the local haunted house, and wasn't expected back for at least another hour or so. So that left me alone on the couch with Chloe. Now, just because I don't believe, doesn't mean that those shows don't freak me out a bit. And being alone now, I have to say I was kind of on edge watching the TV. It wasn't long until I heard the upstairs shower turn on, when the light came on in the patio. Knock, knock, knock at the front door. My initial reaction was, what the hell, really? It's almost 10, go home. But soon an uneasy feeling came over me. Why the knock? Our doorbell glows in the dark, and without the porch light, it would have been extra obvious to everyone there. I paused. I couldn't really just ignore it. Our front door had a big glass panel, and everyone right by the door could easily see inside and know that I was just sitting there watching TV. It would have been rude for me not to answer. Just before I get up, knock, knock, knock again from the door. I glanced down at Chloe, but she was gone. My gaze followed her usual path to the front door, expecting her to be on her way there as she normally does. Nothing. She wasn't there. I stood up to look around the room, and found her crouching by the back door, like she was wanting out. However, she needed to ask to go out like that, she always comes to lick my hand, or puts her head on my knee. This was very out of character for her, and I have to say it heightened my anxiety. Chloe? Great, I said. She just turned back to look at me like, Hell no, lady. I ain't moving. I yelled up to my husband, but if he was already in the shower, I knew there was no chance of him hearing me. Knock. 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 About the time a car drove by our street and cast enough light on the door for me to see the silhouettes of two small children through the glass. I instantly felt relief. It was just some kids. Probably a couple of my neighbourhood on their way back home and wanted to stop by and show me their costumes or something. I headed for the door and looked back to make sure Chloe wasn't following. What a great watchdog I thought I had to myself. She just sat there. I turned on the porch light when I got to the door, and sure enough I could see through the glass. It was a couple of pretty small kids. 
a little late for such young ones, I thought, and began to wonder about what kind of parents would let their kids run around the streets this late at night. I opened the door, enough to see where I could block Chloe's escape if she decided to grow some balls, which was only about two feet. What struck me immediately as odd was that the kids weren't wearing any costumes. They were wearing normal street clothes. Also, no customary trick or treat either. I began to feel very uneasy. It was a girl and a boy. The girl to my left was older, I'd say around 11 or 12. I could tell she was blonde, but I couldn't make out any distinct features, as our lights are from high above and on the columns at the front of the porch, so most of the light was coming from behind them. I had not opened the door wide enough for any of the light to come inside and hit them. The boy was younger, about a foot shorter, and between eight or nine I'd say, and looked to have light brown hair. The girl very politely spoke up. Ma'am, can we please come inside and use your phone to call our mother? As she spoke, something in the pit of my stomach was telling me that something was wrong. What kid, even at that age, doesn't have a cell phone of their own these days? I couldn't remember the last time I'd had anyone ask me to use my home phone. Uh, hun? Don't you have a phone of your own that you can call your mum on? I asked this, and that is when things got really weird. Both kids turned to look at one another, as if they were going to say something. But neither ever spoke. They both turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am. My cell phone battery doesn't have any charge left in it. Can we please come inside and call our mother? We're alone out here, and my brother is scared. I have to admit, there were two competing feelings going on inside me. The first, that of a mother's heart and wanting to help these two small children get to their mother. The other, a sinking fear in my gut that was keeping the other feeling at bay. It was then I noticed that during the short conversation I'd already opened the door a few extra inches, which I was completely unaware of doing. I stopped. Honey, why don't you give me your mother's number and I can call her myself? Another pause, and they looked at each other again. After a short moment they turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my little brother has to use your bathroom. Can we please come inside whilst you call our mother? And with that last statement, the little girl moved closer to the door, almost as if she was going to walk in. As she did, she stepped into the light coming from inside the house, and I got my first real good look at her. Solid, jet black eyes. That's all I could see. That motherly instinct was gone and replaced by terror. I don't think I've ever felt before in my life. I could feel every hair on my arm and back of my neck standing at tension. I closed the door to where my face was just able to stick out. The little girl stopped again and pleaded, Please ma'am, we're really scared and alone out here. We have to come inside. Please, help us. Then, like on cue, both kids began to whimper and cry. That's when the fear took over, and I shut and locked the door. I'll call your mum if you give me the number, I shouted through the door. But I'm not letting you in my house. I could still see them standing there on the porch, just staring at me through the Bellevue glass pane. Part of me wanted to run upstairs to my husband, but the bigger part didn't want to lose track of where they were. That would have freaked me out even more to know that they were not there. After what seemed like forever, but probably a few seconds, I decided to call my neighbour that lived across the street as I made my way to the side table by our couch to get my phone. I glanced back to the door. Chloe was nowhere to be found. We later found her in the guest room under the bed. When I got my phone and started to look for his contact info, it was when the kids had stepped away from the door and had began walking into the street. As they did, 
I walked to the door to get a better look of who they were and where they went, still not calling my neighbour. If you get close enough to the glass, you can see out enough detail to make up people's shapes, but you couldn't see much detail. Of course, standing that close to the door would make you pretty obvious to anyone looking in. From the door, I could see that the kids were standing under the street lamp, nearest my house staring at me. As I lifted the phone to my ear after calling them, only then did the kids start walking down our street. I met my neighbour out under the lamp once he was out there, but the kids were nowhere to be seen. Like I said, I don't believe in any of this stuff, and had never even heard about black-eyed kids before talking to my friend. What I really think, what I have to think, is that these kids were just yanking people's chains on Halloween night. But I will say this for them, they were really, really good at it, and they scared the shit out of me and my dog, black-eyed kid or not. Number 12. It almost felt like a dream. I woke up to my dog Lucy barking. She was upright on the bed where my husband and I were sleeping with our 22-month-year-old daughter. Staring at our door, like an unknown stranger was out there, rummaging around. I thought she was just freaking out over a house noise. We'd only had her for three months and she was still a puppy. It could have been anything. Our roommate, a creak from the house settling, the awnings moving outside in the breeze. I wasn't too concerned initially. I decided the best thing to do would be to open the door and show her that nothing was there. It sounds a bit silly, but that's what we do with our daughter when she gets scared, and I figured that it would work with a puppy too. I opened the door, and she raced to the front door. She stood there snarling. It was an angry, violent growl. One I had never heard her make before. I looked groggily at her, and opened the baby gate, blocking the doorway, planning to open the door, and show her that everything was okay. The second my hand reached for the deadbolt, Lucy went wild. She started barking and jumped towards me, and when I touched the metal, she suddenly changed her temper. She whimpered, almost like she was afraid and backing down. As her mannerisms changed, so did mine. I wasn't calm anymore. My heart was racing and sinking at the same time. I had been flooded with a mixture of fear and dread. I looked through the peephole. I can't explain why I looked, but I did. Outside were two kids. One was only just a smidgen shorter than I, and didn't look much younger. I'm 21, and she looked to be around 16 or 17. She was slender and pale. Her hair was a light shade of honey blonde, and she wore it long, about mid-back with long, thin, blunt bangs in the front that covered most of her eyes. She wore jeans, a light wash that's popular right now, and a thin-looking, olive-coloured pullover-style hoodie. She held the hand of a small girl, who looked to be around the age of four or five in the same style jeans and a button-down ivory cardigan. The smaller one looked at the floor shyly, but had the same shade of hair tied back in a ponytail. She held a stuffed toy under her free arm, and it was identical to one my daughter has, as was the style of dress. Had it not been for the feeling of overwhelming dread and fear, I probably would have asked these children to come in, as well as giving them a hot beverage to get them out of the bitter cold. Something about them seemed off. At this point I hadn't made any noise. 
I hadn't hushed the dog or grumbled. Nothing. I hadn't turned on any lights. Those kids had no indicators that I was at the door. And yet, the older one spoke. She had a voice that was mature, confident, strong, and accentless. She held her head tilted downwards, and I could see her eyes. She said, we have to use your phone. I stood frozen in fear. How did she know that I was there? She raised her head to face me directly, and that's when I saw her eyes. There was a reason I couldn't see them through her bangs before. They were black, or midnight blue, or a dark, dark purple. But nonetheless, they were otherworldly. She said, our mother is worried. As someone who has always been interested in creepy stories, I knew what she was. The second she looked at me through the door. I have never been one to believe in these things, as a staunch atheist and sceptic when it comes to the paranormal. I had written off many a ghost stories from family members and friends, eager to tell their tale. I didn't believe. Still, I could not rationalise my way out of this. I was standing with nothing but a thin wooden door between me and a black-eyed kid. There was no questioning what was right in front of me. I did not answer her. Slowly and silently I backed away from the door, Lucy still cowering at my ankles. She kept talking. Just let us in and use your phone. I took another step back, and with that step the tone changed. At first she seemed polite, but when I took that second step back, she became commanding, almost hostile. We're not going to hurt you. If we wanted to do that, we would have already broken in. Now, I'll ask you again. May we come in and use your phone? Lucy snarled at the door. I inched backwards, though something inside me seemed to be slowly pulling me back towards the door. It wasn't a physical pulling, so much as a subconscious need to go back and let them in. I went into my room, covered up the window and locked the door, and sat in the dim light of the nightlight. I heard her call me back to the door once more, and then quiet. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I haven't slept right since. I know from reading about the BEK that they don't come in without permission. I know they haven't hurt anyone, but I fear that I would have been the exception. But this lingering feeling of sadness, this dread when my house is silent at night, this fear of a knock at the door, tells me otherwise. Number 13. June 25th, 2012 is when this event took place. I had somewhat of a strange thing happen. I woke up at around 3am with my puppy chihuahua Bootsy sitting on my chest and whining at me, looking around all frantic-like. I figured she needed to go out, so I grabbed my phone and looked at the time. It was 3.13am. That was weird. Both my dogs were very regular about their potty breaks, but when you gotta go, you gotta go. My other dog was staring intently into the living room, not moving, just looking. I heard a tapping on the front door. Also strange. My dogs made no noise, just Bootsy softly whining in as she followed me down the hall. I left my phone on the sofa right next to our bedroom door to get leashes and whatnot in order to take the dogs out. When I opened, two children, between the ages of five or six, wearing some kind of greyish blue tunic that almost looked like it was a dress it was so big. The girl spoke right off the bat. Hi, we need to come in. As I'd just woken up, I was a little dumbfounded, and all I could say was, Huh? She repeated the statement. Then I reply, 
Where are your parents? And the boy broke in before I could finish my sentence. Hi, we need to come in now. I then started to observe them a little more closely, as they were standing with the screen door half open. They had porcelain looking skin, almost like paper, twin doll figurines and an androgynous look about them, and their haircuts, and their eyes felt and looked very strange, void, completely black. I didn't know if it was the lack of light or what. It was the boy's tone next that really started to alert me, and my mind started to scream danger. Hi, we need to come in now. I was, for some reason, about to open the door in order to get my phone, which I had left on the sofa. When Mabel, my other chihuahua, starts urinating all over herself, behaviour I have never seen, and whining so bad, which is something I've never seen her do. Bootsy is a whiny dog, but I've never gotten that kind of behaviour out of Mabel. And as a side note, chihuahuas were worshipped and praised in ancient Mexico, and they do not let their owners forget it. So I slightly snapped out of what I was doing and just looked back at them, and they had both taken a step closer inside the doorframe now. They both seemed to be looking right into my face, and their eyes, just like jet black pools of knowledge and venom. I then blacked out. My mind was overwhelmed where I was dreaming the whole thing. Next thing I know, my girlfriend came out and asked me why I was passed out on the couch. I felt like bullets were shot into my head, and I just wanted to go to bed, as she questioned me why I slept on the couch, because that usually meant that there were problems between us. I couldn't recall anything. Then I noticed the time. It was time for her to go to work. She worked in the state capital, and they started work at 7am. So I had lost a bit of time between whatever happened and her waking. My mouth tasted metallic. So I went to get a drink and stepped in dog pee. Didn't think anything of it till next morning, because it was the only real physical evidence I had of it not being a dream. Because I remembered my dog wildly pissing all over the place, like she wanted to paint the room yellow. I wasn't on any drugs or anything, and have never had anything like this happen to me before. Strange for sure, and I did get the feeling at the end that they only meant to harm me in some way. In which way I don't know, but I've only blacked out once in my life, and it was on my 21st birthday, after way too many shots. Number 14 most people say they can sense when something is about to happen. Something feels off or wrong. Maybe, if that were the case, this never would have occurred. Maybe I wouldn't be typing this story. It was late, but I couldn't sleep. Something in my mind was stuck in the on position and refused to budge. After an hour of tossing around under my sheets, I accepted the futility and moved myself into the front room. It had to be about 2 a.m., the television volume on low, playing some older sitcom I was barely aware of. I was on the couch, sleepily watching the ceiling fan. I was pretty calm, despite the late hour and my fatigue. It was the knock on my front door that jarred me from my position. I wasn't really suspicious as much as curious. I lived in a relatively well-off neighborhood. I had no reason to be scared, at first. I looked through the peephole. Nothing. I opened the door, leaving the chain lock intact. Nothing. I gave up and returned to my place on the couch. I think this time, I dozed off, putting the knock down to my restless mind. Really, I had made it up, a figment of my imagination. That is, until it happened again. It was maybe 3 a.m. by the time I opened the door. I was met by something you all know, and fear. At the time, I had no idea. All I saw in front of me were two sad, helpless children. Hello? The first one said. We are lost. It's so late. Can we please come in? We have to call our parents. He seemed so articulate, so smart for a child. He was dressed in such snappy attire it didn't once cross my mind something might be wrong. I just didn't notice the eyes. 
Somehow, my mind skipped right over that detail. The younger one, a girl, stood with her head down. She was dressed down compared to her brother. She wore her dark hair and pigtails, and it was just so long. Something in me was screaming to shut the door, yet I resisted. Two small children alone with no help? I must help them. It was the only moral and ethical decision. While you turned them away, I invited them inside. At first, they seemed surprised. They had been expecting to have the door shut in their face. They couldn't remember the last time it had been so easy. They won't hurt you, I promise. They're just lonely. They have no parents to take care of them. We must help these poor, black-eyed children. They're just lost, alone, and afraid. Besides, you see much better with eyes as black as theirs. You would understand if you let them in, too. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. As I said at the start of the video, we have been sponsored today by Zombie Lips. They're a company that are producing some seriously good chapstick. The founder of this humble enterprise is a member of our horror community on YouTube and an avid listener of this channel, and is working hard pursuing his ambitions. I'm all for helping people try and reach their goals in something that they love. So, if you need awesome chapstick, and fancy helping a fellow member of the community, click the link at the top of the description to check it out, to have your lips feeling as fresh as mine. Don't forget that the Mortis Media merch store is back, so head on over there for some sweet Mortis Media themed apparel. And remember that if you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment as it's a really great way to help support the channel and I appreciate it tremendously. And if you'd like to do something incredible to help support the channel even further, feel free to visit my Patreon. You will be able to find the link in the description as well as the links to my social media. And if you want your story read on my channel, you can submit it as a text post to Reddit, or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.